In this video, we're going to learn about z-scores, our last descriptive statistic before transitioning fully to focusing on inferential statistics. Z-scores are unique because, unlike other descriptive statistics like means and standard deviations, z-scores don't describe groups of people. Rather, z-scores describe an individual. A z-score is simply a transformation of data. We can take a person's raw score and transform it into a z-score, which is better, it's easier for us to interpret. So before I get too far into talking about z-scores and what they are, I want to provide you with a little bit of a definition. A z-score is simply the number of standard deviations a particular score deviates from its corresponding mean. So think about why this is useful for us. If I took a test and I told you that I scored a 122 on that test, you would really have no idea as to whether I did well or poorly on the test. You would need to know more information. For example, how many points is the test out of? And how did other people tend to do on the test? Well, this is where the z-score comes into play because it allows me to factor out all that information. I don't need to know the mean or the variability or anything about the test if I know the z-score. The z-score automatically tells you how well you did compared to your peers, compared to everyone else taking the test. So if, for example, I told you that I got a z-score of 2, positive 2, on the test, you would know that I did really well. I scored two standard deviations above the mean on that test. If instead I told you I had a z-score of negative 1, for example, on the test, you'll know that I scored slightly below average, one standard deviation below average. So let's learn a little bit more about the z-score via an example. So let's say I have two hypothetical students in my class, Stephen and Joseph. And Stephen and Joseph have taken two quizzes so far. You'll see that Stephen did worse than Joseph on quiz 1, but better than Joseph on quiz 2. So here's my question. Overall, who's doing better in the course? Well, it's kind of hard to say, right? Stephen kind of glossed out on quiz 1, and Joseph, uh, you know, lost out on quiz 2. And um, we also have to take other information into account beyond that about the quizzes. Were these quizzes equal in difficulty and in terms of how other students in the class tended to do? It's kind of a complicated question. And in fact, if you look at the scores of everybody in the class on these two quizzes, you'll notice some key differences. On quiz one, for example, you'll see that scores are very variable. They're all over the place. On quiz two, in contrast, scores are very clustered together. Everybody tended to do pretty similarly. So in this case, for quiz one, it's not uncommon to do five or 10 points better or worse than other people. But in quiz two, if you're doing 10 points better or worse than other people, that's a huge difference. It's also important to note that the means are different in these two quizzes. It might be a little bit hard to tell, but the mean for quiz 1, the average, is right about here. For quiz 2, it's a little bit higher. It's right about here. So let's bring up their scores again for Stephen and Joseph. And uh, let me make a note of these two means. So for quiz 1, the average, notice this is a population mean because I'm not generalizing beyond these students. This is my entire population of interest. So for quiz 1, the mean, the population mean is 81.4, and for quiz 2, it's 87.9. So the first thing I'm going to do here is kind of account for the difficulty of these two tests. I'm going to adjust these raw scores for the means. And I'm going to do this by subtracting the mean from each raw score. So here for Stephen, I'm going to do 76 minus 81.4. For Joseph, I'm going to do 81 minus 81.4. On quiz 2, I'm going to do 88 minus 87.9, and for Joseph on quiz 2, 85 minus 87.9. And that's going to give me deviations from the mean. So you can see that on quiz 1, Stephen did quite a few points below the mean. Joseph was almost right at the mean. On quiz 2, Stephen was right at the mean, and Joseph was a few points below the mean. But we still have one more thing to take into account. We've adjusted for the means, but we still need to account for or control for the variability differences between these two quizzes. And you can see these differences here. So sigma, again, population standard deviation, because this is my whole population, um, for quiz 1 is going to be 8.4, quite high. And for quiz 2, it's going to be only 1.1, a very tiny standard deviation. And the way we're going to adjust for these differences in variability is to divide each of these deviations from the mean by the standard deviation. And if I do that, I'm going to get these values here. These are our z scores. And now we can interpret how these two students are doing on these two quizzes in a standardized way. And it's much less complicated of a question in terms of who's now doing better. So here's how we can interpret these values. 
For quiz one, you can see that Stephen and Joseph did relatively similarly. Stephen did 0.64 standard deviations below the mean. Joseph did 0.05 standard deviations below the mean. This is to say that on quiz one, they were both pretty close to the mean. On quiz two, Stephen was still pretty close to the mean, but Joseph, relative to his peers, did very, very poorly. Almost three standard deviations below the mean, which is quite poor. You can see that this is probably his score right here, and he's very far away from everyone else. So in this case, I would actually say that Stephen's probably doing better overall in the course compared to Joseph, and this is the power of the z-score. All right, so let's take a look at the formula. Now we'll get into more detail about this formula in our next video, but for now I just want to take a quick look at it. This is what we just did, and in fact we did this four times on four different scores. We took a person's raw score on a test, we subtracted the mean from that score, and then we divided this deviation from the mean by the standard deviation. So this is going to be your formula for a z-score. This is also, on this slide here, your formula for a z-score. It's the same exact formula with just some algebra done. This formula is superior if you need to find a raw score from a z-score. In reality, though, both formulas are the same. They're comprised of the same sorts of things, and it's just about using whichever is most convenient for the situation that you're in. So I want to end this video by talking about a few uses of z-scores. As we've seen many times already, z-scores are useful for describing scores and distributions with a single number. It factors out the means and the variability. It takes away the necessity of knowing all this information about the original data in the first place, and it becomes something easily interpretable and standardized. I can tell you the z-score of anything, and you'll automatically understand how to interpret that value. So it's a really nice tool for us to have. It's also great for comparing scores from non-equivalent data sets. This is what we did on quiz one and quiz two. These two data sets, scores on quiz one and scores on quiz two, were very different from one another. Yet, if I told you that, you know, I scored, let's say a z-score of three on quiz one and negative three on quiz two, you automatically have a good idea of how I did relative to everyone else on those two quizzes. And finally, you can use z-scores to equate and rescale entire distributions of data. So what do I mean by this? Let's say you have a huge column of numbers, right, a variable. You can z-score everybody in that column, every single person, every single participant, and what you're going to end up with is what we call a standardized data set, a data set that is now comprised of only z-scores. And that data set is naturally going to have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Now you can do that for many different variables, and now you can kind of compare scores from different variables that were originally very different from one another. So the applications here are nearly endless. Z-scores are great then because they're easy to calculate, and they end up being something really useful for us to just understand our data better. In our next video, we're going to learn a little bit more how to calculate z-scores, and we're going to get through some sample data and a sample problem. But keep in mind, again, why are we doing this? It's just to understand how a person is doing relative to everyone else in the data set.